Jesus' suffering on the cross is a picture difficult to understand. He was betrayed by a friend, arrested, and falsely sentenced to death, but Jesus never looked back. He kept going. Jesus could have avoided the cross, called down fire from heaven, or summoned legions of angels to rescue him, to save him. But Jesus was not interested in saving himself. He was all about saving you. Every detail of this torturous path to the cross was part of God's plan to bring you to Him. We're all broken. We've all messed up and have all made wrong choices. And no one had to teach us as a baby about anger and selfishness. We just came out that way. Sort of a sin covering. But on the cross, with His blood He shed, the Bible says Jesus blotted out our record of sin, nailing it to His cross. The blood of Jesus washes away our sin covering. And His blood is our ticket. Our ticket to enter through a new door, a forever relationship door with God. So what do we do with this great news? The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, it's not enough to believe in Jesus with just your head. You must believe with your heart. Now, there's just one person alone at the foot of the cross. It is you. What will you say to Jesus? Say, thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood for me. I'm giving you my heart today, Jesus. I do believe you died for me and that you were raised from the dead for me. Please give me a new heart and a new life right now. Jason Blood Church coming to you today. Pay attention to that salvation message. Uh, it's really important to get saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, a free gift. Uh, Jesus was a God in flesh form, died and lived a perfect life. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 is your gospel. He laid, laid down his life for the forgiveness or remission of your past, present, and future sins. It's a heart belief. According to Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, and Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it is not a works. Lest any man can vote. Subscribe if you're new. Today should be a really good video. We're, we're rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2, 15, we're studying. Uh, and leave your prayer requests if you need them. And please subscribe. Uh, if you wouldn't mind praying for my wife, that'd be good. She's not feeling well today. So, uh, you know, that would, her name's Tara. That would help a lot. Anyway, so the study today is about the Antichrist. We're really going to examine the Antichrist, who he is as a figure, what's he going to be like, what are some of the things that he does during the tribulation, a little bit more deeply and in, in using uh, most of, mostly the Old Testament. We're looking at Daniel, Ezekiel, some other places as well. So follow along in your Bible. If I look down, it's because I'm looking at my notes. So I'll, I'll try to look up too, so, and, or I'm looking at my Bible. So there'll be multiple reasons why I may be looking down during this video. So just bear with me. Jesus Christ, before the first advent, this is just to tee it up. At Luke 2, 1, there was Caesar Augustus, the king of Rome, was implementing a tax that the world should be taxed. And similar, we see in Daniel 11, uh, verse 20, the Antichrist being a raiser of taxes before the second advent or the return of Christ. Let's go to Daniel eleven twenty though, and because we're pretty much going to be in the book of Daniel quite a bit in chapter 11 and 9. And verse 20, Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, but within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. Now, that verse there, I'm going to describe it a little bit, what I believe it means. Um, a couple key things there, we just see that there's a tax. So modern Bibles will remove um, the tax when Jesus was born in Luke 2. They'll, they'll put other, often census or enrollment or things like that. But we see here that he'll be, he'll be a, a collector of taxes. And we see the world today increasing in taxes. No surprise, we get ready for the tribulation. But Daniel 11:20. 20, but within a few days he shall be destroyed. So he's not going to be destroyed in battle, but I think he'll be killed associated with the wars. And, you know, probably assassin, it'll be assassination if we look at Zachariah. Not a probably, it will be. 
Uh, he's killed about the midpoint approximately of the tribulation, and so are the two witnesses killed. The Antichrist is assassinated by a sword with his right eye and his right arm. So if it's a lefty swing in the sword, you know, you could see how that could work, or a righty could do the backhand swipe and, and do that kind of damage. And he is killed by that by that sword. Um, Zechariah eleven seventeen is where we'll go. And the Bible reads, Woe to the idol, not it, so like as in a idol, a figure to worship, idol shepherd, not I-D-L-E. Some will change it to that. Make him lazy. That's not the case. That leaveth the flock, the sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye, and his arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Is the characteristics of, of the Antichrist. Let's go through some of these here. He comes in two parts in 2 Thessalonians. You'll see the man of sin and you'll see the son of perdition. So you have the timeline of the tribulation down here. Then you have this is the first three and a half years or 42 months. And from this midpoint this way to the second advent would be the second three and a half years or 42 months. This could be shortened a little bit. And what you see is he's a vile individual. And we'll cover that now. Uh, and vile in the, in the Bible, it shows up a couple of different times. And it's, it's rather interesting how it shows up. It shows up, and I'm not going to go there, but Judges 19.24 uh, and then Romans 1.26, it's connected with sex, sexual perversion. It is known that the Antichrist does not like women. So probably he's gay or, or anyway, he's a sex pervert regardless. And so we go to Daniel 11.37, we'll see where he's a sex pervert. And the Bible reads at verse 37, Neither shall he regard the God of his father. So that would be, that would be, he's a Jew. And we'll see more verses on that proof here in a minute. But nor desire of women, or nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. So we know Satan wants to do that. He wants to sit in the throne of God. He wanted to rise above the sides of the north. So he is vile. Vile is a sexual tendency that, that's in the point when it comes to the Bible. Uh, he takes control peacefully in the fattest of provinces with flattery. So we have a couple of different things to cover here. But let's go with uh, fattest of province, provinces and flattery. So we go to Daniel eleven twenty four. It's not very far away from where we are. We'll go back to the 24th verse. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. Now that... Fathers and fathers, fa fathers is an expression that the Jews would understand to mean that his fathers, fathers, and his fathers means he's of lineage of a Jew. So he's a Jewish, as we see here in and, and, um, Daniel eleven twenty four. he's a Jew. We'll also see he's of Syrian roots next. So he's a Syrian Jew. We'll see that. But you can see he, he peacefully takes control of the fattest provinces here in 1124. Let's go to 21 and get a few more clues here on the Antichrist. Verse 21. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person. There it is. To whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peacefully and obtain the kingdom with flattery. So that's an interesting middle part of 21. So he is a vile person to whom they, whoever they are, shall not give the honor of the kingdom. So that makes me believe he might not be supported at first by the powerful nations or all of the nations as people think. And there might be resistance. But as we see here, he shall come in peacefully and he obtained the kingdoms by what? Flatterers. So he's obviously the, an ultra politician. And, and able to deliver a message and, and probably give him, he's definitely given the power of Satan and the beast in order to do that. Let's go to 32 and 34. And such as do wickedly against the covenant. So there we see the Daniel 9, 27 covenant, which is the peace with many nations. I'm not going to go there for time's sake. Shall he corrupt by what? Flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploit. So there's going to be some Jews that that fall to that flattery temptation. And there's going to be some Jews that don't. Of course, we know God will protect a remnant in the wilderness, probably down in, in Petra, which is in Edom. Uh, and from this Antichrist, he tries to kill them with a flood, as we know, as we read the book of uh, Revelation as well. 
And Revelation 6, 1, it shows the Antichrist riding in on that white horse. And if we go to read it, you'll see he comes in without an arrow. He does have a bow, but he doesn't shoot arrows. And so when you go like this with a bow, it means peace, right? Well, this means war. And it's also like known that kill them or go get them. But anyway, let's read it. Verse 1 of Revelation 6. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, and one of, the four, one of the four beasts saying, come and see, verse two, and I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow, no arrow, and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So we know he does conquer and we're gonna see some of his conquerings here in a minute. He's not just peaceful once he gets power, but he is initially peaceful. He's known as the king of the north. He also has other titles like the man of sin. And we're gonna see that throughout this. And we did look how he was a Jew by heritage already. Now, if you look at what area of the king of the north is, it is represented by the Euphrates River, the northern part, the southern part, and in Assyria. And he comes, for Syria was the area where Babylon was sort of known to be as well as really in Iraq today. So he is a Syrian by nature. All right, he also was killed by a sword. We look at that. He does do a covenant with many nations, including Israel in Daniel 9.27 and Daniel 11.23. It mentions his covenant in a couple other places as well. And one of the interesting things about him being vile, or if he is gay or sexual perverse, would be that goes with the days a lot. And we know that, you know, at our at the tribulation will be like the days a lot. The end times are like the days a lot, where they had sexual perversion. We saw how he, he tainted by flesh. Let's go to verse 22 where we see the flood, and we also see an interesting character being introduced that we once haven't seen. So we have a character being introduced in Daniel eleven twenty two that um, some people thought, you know, weren't sure who it is. And to me, I think it reads pretty clearly when you read it and believe what you read. But it sounds like there's a leader that opposes the Antichrist of the Jews that gets killed during this first part of the, uh, you know, sometime in this first three and a half years of the tribulation. Again, not everything's in order in the Bible necessarily, so that's where the timeline gets a little bit fuzzier, and I'm not able to point exactly where it is. All right, uh, Daniel eleven twenty two, and with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Now, there are people that believe that, you know, there are people that say, hey, it's a little flood and God will open up the earth and it'll swallow the flood. But some people believe, hey, it's an army. It could be symbolic of an army, the arms of a flood. That could be a flood of men coming over to attack Israel uh, and, 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 to and attack this prince of the covenant and kill this prince of the covenant. In verse 23, and after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. Maybe not with many nations, but with a small group. And we know Satan come, or the Antichrist has 10 kings and 10 kingdoms that support him. Could be the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire reestablished, and including those European nations. Could be a possibility. I'm not saying that scripture. I don't really know. But there will be 10 kings and 10 kingdoms that he comes with. But he comes with a strong, he comes strong with a small people. And in verse 24, he shall enter peacefully even upon the fast places. The promise, we saw that. And, um, and, he, and he shall, and at the end of this, and he shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. So he's going to take all the glory, all the money, all the riches, all, everything that he wants. He's going to take it peacefully. And at the end of verse 24, he shall forecast his devices against the stronghold even for a time. So that's, that's an interesting verse. I want to unpack that real quick. Man, when I look at my notes for this one. Uh, and so the Antichrist is the king of the north, and he'll fight against what's called the king of the south. We're going to see that here shortly. In verse 24, the Antichrist, we see him, he gets power peacefully, and he forecasts his devices against the strongholds. Now, devices in the, in the Old English means to plan strategically ahead of time. So before he came in with the peace plan, he already knew his plan his, his plan, his strategy was to then go ahead and break that covenant, take the stronghold, take all the riches, and sit on that, and sit in Jerusalem after the midpoint. He was going to be in Jerusalem for sure, and Satan incarnate will sit upon that mercy seat, and the desolation will begin, and, and they'll realize they've been duped, and they'll run off. We'll see that. Now, again, that flood might be a literal flood. It might be symbolic of an army. I'm not sure. 
So the Antichrist is the king of the world. Syria is the head of that. And so that makes him a Syrian Jew. The Antichrist in verse 25, we see he has a campaign against the king of the south. So we start to see where he's going to wage war here, as it said he would do. He's going to wage war, as it said he would do. So here we go in verse 25. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. So definitely there's a great army the Antichrist has. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army himself. But he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. So, for they shall forecast devices against him. So there was a plan, and then probably an internal plan, to, to betray the king of the south. And the king of the south would be Egypt, if you look at the Bible. Now, it may not be just Egypt. It could be Sudan, Libya, Ethiopia, maybe even Saudi Arabia combined with Egypt, because that was at one point in time the territory that Egypt did control. So I don't know if it's exactly those countries. It could just be uh, Egypt or someone in that area. Maybe it's not even Egypt. But it would go to suggest that that would be Egypt in the Bible, uh, historically speaking. If we, go, if we keep reading, you'll see in verse... 27, and both these kings' hearts shall be, be to do mischief. So the king of the south and king of the north, and they shall speak lies at one table. So we see them at a table together, probably like a peace summit, and they're speaking lies to one another, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the appointed time. So that, the fact that in verse 27 it says the end should be at the appointed time, it makes me not believe it's historically back when uh, you, had, you, had the, you had the battle, you had Syrian battles. There were like four or five of them between Egypt and Syria. Th that historically did happen. And a lot of people will make that argument that that's really just about that. Well, it's not when you see verse 27 and it talks about the, for yet the end shall be at the appointed time. That's end times. And one of the things uh, that's interesting is it's not surprising that leaders or politicians will lie, but they'll sit at this peace summit of sorts, the king of the north and the king of the south. And if you know, um, a lot of these nations are Islamic today, the ones I mentioned with Egypt, for example, and the, and the king of the south, uh, they have something called tekiyah. Tekiyah is, a, is, it's okay to lie, deny your own religion, to lie to somebody, to benefit your religious cause and your beliefs. And that could be, you know, sort of why that happens. Uh, just food for thought there. Verse 28. So what happens in verse 28? Then shall he, the Antichrist, return into his land with great riches. His heart shall be against the holy covenant. So now he's going to come against that that Daniel 9 covenant that he breaks at the midpoint. And he's going to, in here, Daniel 11, it shows that, which is another reason why I believe this is not just historically about, you know, the past. And shall do exports and return to his own land. So we see him coming. That could be, a lot of people believe that. It's like Clarence Larkin, for example, believes that's actually going to be Babylon rebuilt in the tribulation, which is close to Syria, which would make sense. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, on the Euphrates River. Anyway, he's going to return to his own land, wherever that is. Verse 29, at the time appointed, he shall return and come towards the south, but it shall not be as the former or the latter. What happens in verse 30, and I do believe it's Babylon as well. Uh, if you look at Numbers 24, 24, you see what you're going to see in verse 30 as well. It says, Chittim, for the ships of Chittim shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So I think his plan was to go back and to, to go ahead and, and, and take Egypt again to conquer the king of the, the south land again. But on the way, he was stopped. And these ships shall come from the coast of Shittim. Now, Shittim in, in, in uh, Numbers 24, 24 refers to the, or, the origin of it is Cyprus. Now, that doesn't mean these ships will come from Cyprus. They could come from any of the coastal countries in the Mediterranean Sea, which are many of them. So I'm not sure where, the, where they will come from in the tribulation, but he will be stopped. Uh, that was a, a, originally a Phoenician colony in Cyprus. But Shittim, you know, is anybody who dwells along the coast. That's sort of its definition. So during the tribulation, it can come from any of those nations. And that is what we'll see. And so what happens is at that point, he just, he, the, the, the Antichrist just goes on into Jerusalem. He's, he's assassinated here. So all this happens in, you know, in this time period, the king of the north versus king of the south. Then he's assassinated here. And that's when the son of perdition, Satan incarnate, Judas Iscariot, enters into the Antichrist body and the great tribulation kicks off. And the persecution of the Jews with the flood and all that really happens. And anyway, I hope this was a great study. It's really a deeper dive into the Antichrist. 
he does have that covenant with, with many nations or leagues of nations here, as we see. He does have devices to plan to break that covenant. In other words, those are plans he made, and he does war with the king of the south, often, especially early on in the, early on in the first part of that tribulation. And there could be other wars as well in other places. The second horse is the red horse of war. And the third horse is the famine, and then you have pestilences and whatnot, which come with war. And there, you see war here in the beginning with the Antichrist and the king of the south, representing maybe not just the war there, but maybe world war all over the world, but definitely involved with those countries or regions I mentioned. Anyway, I hope this was a blessing. God bless and have a great, great day.